thank you so much for inviting me here. Thanks to Shannon, all the people in the Department of Philosophy, to the Kerr Lawson family, and all the folks I've gotten an opportunity to talk to uh, since I've been here for this very long day, but a really rewarding day. Um, I was really uh, honored and excited uh, to get the invitation, in part because it came just as I was having a very hectic semester trying to work on this book about Audre Lorde. Um, the Audre Lorde book is not primarily uh, my sort of usual mode of philosophical writing. It's meant for a different so sort of audience, um, mostly people interested in Audre Lorde's life, but also in political theory. And so I am <laughs> this close to being done with that book. And thinking about Audre Lorde these last few um, months pretty much exclusively um, uh, really has enlivened some of my other uh, projects. And so you all are the first audience that I'm talking about some of these intersections with. Uh, so I am especially uh, interested in the conversation that we might have about the things that I'm going to talk about. So the title of uh, my talk today is Growth and Survival, but especially Survival, Black Feminism as Pragmatism. Uh, a note about the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is a way to attract perhaps your eye uh, to something other than me talking. I will try not to read to you. Um, the major quotes uh, that I am using to sort of ground my talk will be on the PowerPoint slides. Um, the slides themselves uh, won't hold much other information uh, other than the quotes. I find it's always helpful for me when I'm in an audience and someone's talking to me to have multiple modes of engagement. So this is a, just a multi, another mode of engagement. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, black feminism and some of you may be familiar with pragmatism. I would uh, wager a bet most of you are not familiar with the two in conversation with one another. Um, and part of my lifelong now project, it's been almost two de decades of thinking about this, is to figure out why I want them to be together so badly. Um, and so part of it has everything to do with my engagement with thinkers like Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde was a black poet, feminist, lesbian, mother, warrior, right? She often described herself in a sort of string of identity terms, and they were all very important to her. She's most known in both the academy and outside the academy for her poetry, mostly poems like this one, A Litany for Survival. Uh, the idea of survival recurs so many times in her work that I started to, be, to think, I'm missing something really important here, right? As, I was writing, as I'm writing this book about her life, and um, lots of friends on Facebook share quotes with Audre Lorde. If you've gone to any sort of women's march or protest recently, someone has a quote, your sounds will not protect you, right? The master's tools will not dismantle the master's house, right? Everyone has something to say if they think they're sort of socially justice motivated, at least in the US, uh, about Audre Lorde. But I found, of course, as philosophers do, that people were perhaps riffing off of Audre Lorde but missing some things, myself included as someone who thought that she knew a lot about Audre Lorde. And I kept coming back to these lines about survival. Right? The, the poem is rather, rather long, this is just a bit. And uh, she goes through and she says, look, we're afraid of lots of things. And they're real things to be afraid of. So she says, it's better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. And it dawned on me as I was working on, her pro on this project that I actually had a favorite poem about survival. And it was such a favorite poem that when I was finishing my dissertation, I made it uh, the prologue to a dissertation about democ participatory democracy, where Dewey featured, um, which my advisor thought was strange, but she allowed. Uh, I later have gone back to look at, you know, you archive it with the university. They took out the page with a Lucille Clifton poem. Um, I think this is really interesting. I guess it wasn't uh, to the format. But it was very important to me. It's so important that I usually don't make it a, 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 a practice to read to people, but I think it's one uh, that I'll, I'll read to you. Won't you celebrate with me what I've shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? 
I made it up. Here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight, my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Something has tried to kill me and has failed. I was writing a dissertation that I thought was very important. At the same time, I was part of organizing um, against a law in Georgia that would um, hold uh, underage, mostly girls, criminally responsible for being prostituted. And there was these nights we were spending protesting at the state capitol, and these other nights that I was trying to write bits of this dissertation. And it was sort of in the span of weeks that this Lucille Still Clifton poem kept coming to my head. And a friend came to me and said, do you know that Lucille Clifton was going to be here on campus. Um, Emory owns her archive and she came um, in 2006. And I said, I have no time, I have to write the dissertation. And a friend convinced me to go. And uh, Lucille Clifton wrote a very um, kind, um, uh, she, she signed the book with something very kind. And I kept thinking about this over and over. And as I started to work on the lore book, I kept thinking about what is this, idea of celebration and survival, and how does that have anything to do with what I am working on? And so the talk um, I'm going to give is a bit about how I'm working through that, how I can be really committed to what I think of as important social justice projects um, that seem to have very little to do with the things that I'm doing in the academy, even as I'm trying to get clear about things that I think have everything to do with social justice, right? What does it mean uh, to think these things through? So an outline. I'll start by asking a, a sort of so what series of tough questions uh, to sort of ground and let you know where I'm coming from. And then I'll talk a bit about uh, black feminism, what I think it's doing, um, and why I call it a reconstruction uh, in philosophy. Then I'll talk about growth. And, and I will talk a bit about the pragmatist John Dewey, in part because I think that there is something um, fruitful and interesting about thinking about those convergences. And I'll, I'll say a bit about what that is. And mostly I'll talk about this notion of survival and Audre Lorde and how I think that translates into an answer, a celebration um, of the so what questions. It's, it's a way forward. I, here I say the way forward. I think in the slides, I fix it. I think I say a way. It's not the only way. So, so what? In 2014, I was teaching at the University of Dayton as Black Lives Matter uh, was becoming uh, sort of national headlines all over the United States. This was particularly pressing in Ohio, which saw uh, quite a few, um, uh, I think, really um, public and newsworthy uh, cases of the militarization of the police leading to uh, the death of black people, right? Including Tamir Rice and John Crawford III. And I had students who were um, up in arms. What are we supposed to do? Lots of those students ended up in my office. Dr. James, what are we gonna do? Right, what are we gonna do? And I was like, ah, I don't know. Other people are having a protest. That's what you can go do. And I kept hearing this question in my head, right? Um, I had friends who did applied philosophy, right? They worked in hospitals and nonprofits. Um, I had friends who wrote about social justice. But I kept thinking, but what most of us do is we write to each other and we talk to each other and we get really clear about ideas. What are our ideas doing in the world? And so my students were sort of asking me, though, what use is all this stuff? you've told me is important for these issues. What use is it when we're thinking about things like social death, but also physical death, right? And even more pointedly, right, to me, what use is all of this stuff you're talking about, black feminism and pragmatism? And so part of this is sort of an inward look, but I think it has some outward ramifications. So I had to figure out what I was up to. Um, throughout the PowerPoint, you'll see these little cartoony figures. I draw them when I'm procrastinating from writing, right? They're all me. Um, this one is my, my friend Christy and I. She's also a black feminist philosopher. In my attempt to figure out, articulate the so what, why am I doing this? Why am I spilling so many pages on it? Why do I think it's so important and vital? I start to think about, well, what am I saying is black feminist philosophy? What, what is it? What does it mean? I've taken it up as a marker. 
I think of it as a sort of attitude, disposition that I have, but, but what does it mean? So I did a very academic thing. I went to Academic Search Premier. There's a, it's one of the big database bases of peer reviewed research. And I put in the string black feminist philosophy. So here's the point where there's some audience interaction. I click the little peer review button, right? So not just uh, anything. How many things do you think it returned? How many things? When I put in the, the black feminist philosophy and click the button, how many things do you think came up? Four. Oh, that, that's, that's pretty low, but pretty close on. So 20 unique hits of those after looking, three of them, I, I don't think anyone would think of it as black feminist philosophy. I'm not sure how that became the string of key terms. Of the 17 that were left, myself and Christy account for about half of those citations. You laugh. And about half of those citations. And I know personally each and every person who counts and the rest. So then I did a wider string of searches. So black, black feminism and philosophy. And then I went searching for some things I knew were out there that were both black feminist and, say, written by philosophers. And what I realized is there were sort of three types of black feminist philosophy going on in professional philosophy. The first was discovery or recovery projects. And this happens in feminist philosophy more widely, right? Um, people had gone into the past and said, you know what, women, uh, we're thinking about these things too. Let's add them in. Let's make them important, legitimate to the field. I have done some of that work. Some of those um, uh, check boxes of, in the database are work that I've done on people like Anna Julia Cooper, right? Writing a paper on Cooper with William James now makes her sort of in part of the philosophy peer reviewed thing. There are lo lots, there are a few discovery and recovery projects, right? Going back to say, what were, say, black women doing at the turn of the century, where we have this sort of larger um, uh, time where uh, there are now increasingly a sort of interest in, say, uh, black thinking, um, in the US especially, um, what were black women thinking about, right? So there's some of those projects. And then there were, once I put in some different key terms and I got into the dozens of returns, um, projects that have something like a black feminist attitude or sentiment, right? In those projects, you get someone who uh, maybe drops the name, Audre Lorde gets dropped a lot. Philosophers really like to talk about not using the master's tools. I would dare say some of them need to reread the essay that it comes from. Um, but, so, you know, so, so there are, there, there's the sprinkle in effect, right? I'm talking about some social justice issue. I want to say it is inclusive. I want to say I have multiple sources. I'm really sort of still just talking about Rawls, but here's some bell hooks, right? There are quite a few of those. I'm also guilty. I got some of those, right? Um, or guilty or I've done it, right? It, it describes me. But there are actually very few what I've been calling generative projects. Projects that center not just black women as historical figures or sort of the spice in our philosophy celery soup, um, but projects that say, you know what, what would it be to think about these issues, these questions, and come from a point of view that didn't make the black feminist uh, perspective additional. And so in some ways, I think of this as a reconstruction. Um, conversations I've had with Christy about this um, have been really helpful because we find ourselves doing similar projects, but from very different subfields, right? All of those different fields of philosophy you mentioned before. She's an epistemologist. I'm a pragmatist of all things. And what I also found in looking in that very small na few names of people who do something like a centering project around black feminism and philosophy is that we have very small audiences that can understand sort of the multi sort of different strands of what we do. Uh, Chrissy and I are great friends, but she is interested in analytic philosophy, right? I don't do analytic philosophy, especially not epistemology. I'm a, like a really bad Jamesian, right? You know, meaning and truth. Yeah, what's it for, right? What does it, what does it accomplish? And that doesn't quite go in our current era for epistemology. And so I wanted to figure out 
why was I really comfortable with the first two types of projects, uh, even though I said what I wanted to be doing was a generative project? And so I started to think about what would it be uh, to talk about black feminism and pragmatism in a way that both built an audience, right? So I've come here to talk to people who have some familiarity with, say, pragmatism, um, but also uh, to think about not just building the audience, but doing some different work with black feminism in philosophy of all things. And so the first thing I had to get clear about was, well, what did I mean by black feminism? There are black feminisms, right? Lots of different ideas floating out there. This particular part of the Combahee River Collective Statement has followed me on every office door I've ever had, even um, as a graduate student who was teaching. Um, I let everyone know that I'm struggling against all of these oppressions, and I see my task, right, as doing that in analysis and practice. And um, it's gotten me in trouble just one time. Uh, when I first started the job I have, a student came to my door and said, what does that mean? And so we talked about it a bit. And he says, I don't know. I feel like that, that's against sort of what the university is for. And so we had a really interesting com conversation about why I didn't think that was the case. But recently, I've been starting to think, in part because of the Lord book, that my idea of black feminism was sort of incomplete, like what the task was. And part of it was that I was concentrating really on having the right attitude, right? But not thinking about what, say, a methodology would be, uh, what sorts of resources I could find in black feminism to do the sort of philosophy I wanted to do, but also to answer some of those so what questions. And Audre Lorde has really helped me think about this in part because if you read anything she's written about her own life, when she talks to people, um, when she talks to people in interviews, she reiterates over and over, I'm interested in survival and teaching. Survival and teaching. And she says, you know, when asked what she wants you know, to teach her son, you know, she's this radical lesbian uh, feminist, and someone says, you know, what do you want to teach your son? And she, she says, I want to teach the same, him the same thing I want to teach my daughter, and she, comes up with lots of things and she says, how to survive, how to grow, and it's my job, right, to, to teach them that, how to survive and grow. And I said, oh, wait, this sounds like something for me to think through. So I started to think about my other commitments, right? Uh, James lets us know um, that, you know, pragmatism is lots of things. It's a method for some, a theory of truth, an attitude, and I think increasingly in professional philosophy, it's a type of tradition or canon, right? Uh, people know what you mean when you say pragmatism, even if you might mean lots of different things. They can give you a list of the guys, right, who are the, the pragmatists. And so I said, what about my attitude, uh, call, pragmatism calls to me? And part of that was what I have now come to see as these convergences between uh, Dewey's project and Audre Lorde's project. Um, John Dewey famously, right, uh, was for people outside of philosophy um, a champion of education, right? And he thought education was what we needed uh, in the United States especially uh, so that people could become civic-minded, socially responsible, and that so society could improve, right? He was really committed uh, to this idea that people could, right, be given better conditions so that they could grow. Right? I'm going to get back to growth in a second. And part of that had everything to do with I, this idea of you know, being able to control, right, to achieve certain sorts of ends. Um, and Dewey had his own ideals. Right? He was also a philosopher of democracy. He had grand hopes of sort of the social experiments that could lead us to having a more democratic society. Sometimes I read Audre Lorde and she sounds a lot like John Dewey, which would freak some people out. I've talked to people about this and they're like, look, Audre Lorde is too radical to sound like John Dewey. Don't do that. And I was like, okay, cool. But there are these convergences and I'll talk a bit about perhaps some differences. And one of them, right, is about how she talks about teaching, right? And she says part of teaching is a way to be in control of events. And so I just think about what does she mean by control? Does she mean to be sort of dominating nature and the world? And I said, no, that rings wrong. So what does she mean? 
it always right comes back to not always i won't be that sort of um strict in my interpretation but she often couples it with this idea of survival right that that we teach so that we can survive, that future generations that can survive. She also had a really interesting um, eco perspective that the world should survive. And part of that teaching is because we want to grow in ways that help us both understand the world, but also express ourselves in multiply different ways. Sounds a lot like Dewey, but with some, I think, some important nuances and differences. So, I think it's interesting, since part of what I'm doing is audience building, some, some of you may be much more familiar with Dewey than you are with Audre Lorde. Right? Dewey um, was also famously a philosopher who liked to say a lot about growth. Right? You read Experience in Nature, you read Democracy in Education, and like every other line has something about growth. Right? Growth, he says, is the only moral end. Right? People like Sidney Hook were like, why did you say that? What does that mean? The philosophers picked it apart. Right? Um, what, sorts, what sort of thing is moral growth? Don't organisms just grow? Can't you grow badly? When we think about morality, can't you grow in having habits that are immoral? Right? What is Dewey on about? Now, if I was in a different mode, I sometimes wear that hat, I could go through and tell you all of the different types of ways Dewey thought about growth, why we still sh should still keep the concept. Um, I'm happy to do some of that in q and Not gonna do much of that here, what I really want to point out is that Dewey thought that growth right, is not something uh, that you, you just sort of do once. Right? You grow and learn in school. We sometimes use education and growth interchangeably. But that growth was this thing that people, but also other living organisms, um, would do, perhaps, uh, in lots of different conditions, but they can grow better, flourish in different ways if we attend to it, right? And so he was really interested in a type of education that didn't seek to control, right? Didn't seek to set rules, but seek, sought in some ways in our sort of contemporary language to give uh, people the capacities uh, to learn how to deal with new and novel situations, how to integrate the best uh, science and social science to work on social problems, uh, how to relate to one another in ways that he thought were more democratic. Now, one of the problems, I think, of the view, and this is often sort of trudged up, uh, there is a ongoing now, decades-long conversation that Dewey just doesn't understand power, right? That he has no sense of the tragic. Um, you get a lot of that, especially in commentary about Dewey that wants to do anything with race or feminism. I won't rehash those debates, but people say, look, Dewey isn't saying things about oppression and domination, right? at least not straightforwardly, so we can't really use what Dewey has going on because he's not attending to the lived experiences, especially of people like, say, the black people at the time that he was writing. And here is where I think Lord on Survival really pushes us to really attend to lived experience as an important part, not of just our f philosophizing on paper with one another, but sort of the work that maybe us people who are philosophy inclined can do in the world. Um, so Audre Lorde grew up in uh, Manhattan. She was born in the early 1930s uh, to uh, immigrant parents from the Caribbean. And very early on, uh, there were lots of things happening in her life um, that made her uh, be an outsider, she thought, both to her family, but also to the rest of society. Uh, she didn't talk until she was uh, almost five years old. Uh, she had uh, problems seeing. Um, there were lots of things happening in her life as she grew up. Uh, she recognized that the, the uh, normative social roles didn't quite fit both her sort of sexual identities, but also her gender identities. Um, she had different language than, say, we have now about those things, right? So from you know, her early adulthood, she identified as a lesbian. And she said, you know, there were all these ways that she wanted to belong. She had a family um, that I, I think she thinks, uh, came to think, deeply cared about her, but wanted her to conform to be normal, to, to be a good girl of a certain sort, uh, and she couldn't quite do it, right? She was in a society where she was, uh, she ended up being a very precocious 
a uh, child uh, who wanted to write poetry, uh, but it was a society where she was one of few black students, definitely one of few students um, who, uh, what we, who would, we would identify as having a, a queer identity. And she found herself always, she thought, on the outside, right? And she said, she looked at the world and she said, the thing about the outside is it sucked, right? It sucked to be on the outside. There were, there were, there were days and events and things that happened in her life that she thought she would not survive, right? Literally, destruction, death, right, are part of the things that she thought about what her life could have ended up as. But she also didn't want to be on the inside, right? The inside of the systems of oppression, uh, the types of norms uh, that were really constricting to the people around her. Um, she didn't want that either because she saw them uh, to be uh, the type of uh, uh, social arrangements that would always um, uh, hurt people instead of letting people grow in the ways that they would. And so she wanted to think through and, and did uh, what it means to sort of be on the outside and to think about this idea of the type of power that it gives. And so uh, one of the episodes of the, her life that she tells is that she was um, uh, at home and it's an old house and at this point she uh, had had kids and uh, they were off somewhere and it was during the middle of the day and a old window fell on her hand and her hand got stuck right and she couldn't get it out and so she had to yell and yell and yell and hope that people were, would find her and it took about seven minutes she says um, for someone to come and find her and during that experience, she said, the pain seemed unbearable, right? And she thought about all sorts of things that she could do to sort of fix it and what couldn't be done, mostly barring, you know, getting, taking her hand off some way, she had to suffer. And she said, she learned something about pain. And that was, it was either gonna change, right? Either it was gonna alter itself, or it was gonna stop, right? There would be some alleviation. Um, sometimes those are terminal alleviations. And this for her was really informative about what pain could mean for her living, right? That pain was a part of life, right? And that pain itself didn't have to be instructive in the sense of if you live through it, you'll be better, but rather, it could be something that you could learn from, right? And that this idea was that she was really strong, but not strong in that sort of weird sense that I can conquer anything, but that she could survive lots of different things. And for her, this meant a couple of really important things, right? I'm keeping an eye on my time here. This, this idea that survival, right? It's not like hope. She was really worried about this idea of social hope. Right? Dewey's often talked about as philosopher of social hope. And so here's where there's some tensions. For, for Audre Lorde, she says hope in multiple places. She says, she says it in, in poetry, but she also says it in some prose and in one interview that hope is counter-revolutionary. And she says the reason why hope is counter-revolutionary is that it is a certain sort of blindness and she uses that sort of ableist term, you know, it's a different time, right? It's a, it's a certain way that we don't see something really important about living, right? And she says that it's a seduction of power. Powerful people tell you to be hopeful. Things will change in the future. If you can just wait, right? Or if you will just um, do this thing instead, then maybe, right, you can uh, raise yourself up into the right class, right? And so uh, in a, a conversation she has, someone asks her why she's so down on hope. And she says, hope is the type of thing that one, anesthetizes us to pain, right? It says, oh, I hope that the pain will end and therefore I'm supposed to feel better about it, right? I'm not supposed to stick with the pain, learn something about the pain, live through the pain. I'm supposed to always be hoping for the next, right? Uh, and she says, the other thing is, hope is a tool of oppression. It tells certain people that, look, if you wait or if you do this right thing, then suddenly things will be better. And she says, in this, in this um, 
uh, conversation, she says, this is what happens to uh, poor whites, right? She says, the, the big society, she, this is a comment on capitalism, the big society says to them, look, here's the thing. You're not the lowest rung of society. And if you just bootstrap, you work hard, you do the right thing, you have hope, right? And, and the organization of society, things will be better, right? Audre Lorde had very little sort of um, uh, patience for that. But what she did have patience for is something that I saw earlier in Lucille Clifton, right? This idea, right, of a celebration as a way forward, right? Audre Lorde, like some of the black feminists that I trace as part of uh, what I think I'm doing both in the academy but outside of the academy, was really um, interested in a couple of things. And one of them is this notion of the future, right? The future, not as set, not as uh, an ideal that we're definitely going to meet, but this idea of imagining the world otherwise and living into the possibility of it while still surviving in the world as it is, right? It's not a flight of fancy. You don't um, say, what I want, really want is a great world, so I will turn, to, turn away from the things that you know, are, aren't good. But rather, um, the, the thought of the future is really important. But also, right, um, that pain is not all there is. In our contemporary conversations, especially around issues of uh, things like um, uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, Me Too, there's this often totalizing way that we think of uh, suffering, right? That if we want to look at sort of gender and race and class, that all there is to it is just suffering, right? That we should get rid of those things because people suffer, right? Or that there isn't a way to fix society, right? Society, uh, because say it's um, uh, white supremacist or sexist, uh, cannot be ameliorated, right? The, the pragmatists are wrong because these things are so entrenched in society, all there is is the suffering, right? People like Audre Lorde um, will say that you're giving too much to the totality of all of those isms, right? That there are things about the lived experience of people who may be suffering, who may be oppressed, um, that not only are to be celebrated, but present for us a different way forward, all right? And so I started to think about, well, what does that mean? What is there to celebrate in such dire times, right? What does it mean uh, that you can go to, like I said, any protest around and, and find, you know, Audre Lorde on a sign? Um, I also, in the season where in the U.S. we were having lots of women's marches since 2016, there have been quite a few, um, I went to three within a month, um, and a friend and I made a sort of game of counting how many times we saw something that referenced R.G. Lord at these, these things, right? So she's in some ways a poster girl for uh, these protests. But one of the things that I started to think about was this notion of um, celebrations. And it seemed like the wrong word, right? I'm thinking about suffering. The so what was like, what are you supposed to do? And I am not at all usually considered an optimist. Remember, I'm with Audre Lorde about how hope goes. But one of the things that I realized that in the projects that I thought of as generative philosophy projects that I thought were really important was that I had uh, to go to the second bullet, really started to center the lived experience of the folks that I was interested in, some of them my folks, um, that had perhaps only arisen because of these conditions, but were not those conditions, right? The life worlds of folks um, that make beautiful both art and music, but also make structures and communities, right? Um, that are perhaps where we should be looking for our, our ideals. I think of the collaborative ways that some of the folks that I've worked with in uh, these more um, activist settings um, come up with ways that they are going to govern themselves, ways that they're gonna make sure everyone has somewhere to sleep, to eat, ways that they're gonna bail people out if folks go to jail, right? All of these community structures that when I look to say, the philosophy, no one's saying, let's attend to these features of a community. What would a community be like? What would a structure be like if we had these sorts of um, experiences as the center of thinking about what we should and ought do, 
right? And that also has led me to be really in, uh, involved and in thinking of new ways to be involved in types of what I call community elaborations. Um, Philosophers, at least the ones I know, sometimes come to social justice projects with lots of sharp tools, right? We'll say, don't say this, do say that, do do this, don't do that. And we often do that because we spend a lot of time, you know, analyzing, you know, very minute details and arguments. Um, I actually have a full paper I could have read, I was talking to Shannon about this earlier, I could read you sort of the argument version of this, um, where, where I can defend all of these views. But in certain settings, what I found that does is it presumes, right, one, that we know best about what the ends of the aims of the action should be, but it also presumes that that is what we should be after, right, that we should be after precision and not things like survival, right? One of the things that Lord was really attending to was, Given the sorts of social structures and pressures that people have, what are the sorts of lives that people can lead that would both change them, perhaps for the future, or at least participate in fighting against them, but also that would um, take very seriously uh, individuals' desires, wants, aims to grow in ways that the society says it shouldn't, right? And, and so one of the things that I'm really trying to work on is how am I using this great privilege of time I often have to sit and think about these ideas, not to wield them as sharp tools, right, but to go into spaces and be one of the people participating in the ways that communities can elaborate new and different ways of being. And the last point, and it is not a frivolous point, is a point about style. One of the things that keeps coming back as I try to think of answers to the so what question. Um, I sort of flippantly said recently, um, and perhaps um, I would regret it if I was the sort of person that regrets, um, in a conference where someone was like, well, you know, the right attitude right now is a sort of pessimism, right? That's a, one of the catch phrases in certain circles right now, and I said, we're really pessimistic at this, you know, very nice hotel at this very nice conference, <laughs> having these very nice conversations. And I was being sort of flippant, and I recognized that I perhaps was not putting my best foot forward. But one of the things that I, I really, you know, want to, to work on for myself, but also perhaps invite you as an audience to think about, is this um, power that we give uh, to um, all of sort of the death dealing dealers without the celebration of the ways in which people have lived, right, and continue to live really robust and interesting lives. And style is important, right? Not just the way sort of we look and we dress. I'm not talk just talking about the aesthetic, I'm talking something about. Um, reorienting what we think we're doing when we are sort of participating in certain spaces. So for me, part of the way forward, right, uh, what the use of um, something like a black feminist pragmatism is, is it's entering in all sorts of conversations saying that there is something very positive and not in a sort of simplistic way about people, all sorts of people, who have survived and thinking through, what does it mean to talk about growing, right? Go ahead, Dewey, I like it. But also this idea of surviving. Um, I think I'll stop there. I'd love to talk to you a bit more about it. I hope that was enough to start our conversation. Thank you.